Hoffman has more than 45 years of water conservation and water resource planning experience. He is a former trustee and vice chair of the AWD AWWA's Water Conservation Division. Uh, Bill has authored um, numerous papers, articles, and co-authored several books on all aspects of water conservation. Uh, Bill has both a Bachelor of Science and a Master's Degree in Engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. Tom Meyer is the uh, Technical Program, I'm sorry, Director for Technical Programs of the, uh, for the National Environmental uh, Balancing Bureau. Until recently, he was the Director of Government and Professional F Affairs for the ESCO Group. Uh, Tom uh, is a graduate of The Ohio State University uh, with more than 25 years experience in hydronics. He is a past president of Pre uh, Precision Hydronics Corporation, which is an international hydronics design consulting and training firm. Uh, Tom was the founding executive uh, director of the uh, Green Mechanical Council and President of Praxis Green Incorporated, which is an international sustainability consulting and training firm. Uh, Bill and Tom, please come to the podium. Good morning. I'm Tom Meyer, Director of Technical Programs for the National Environmental Balancing Bureau. Together with Bill Hoffman, Principal of Bill Hoffman and Associates, we will be presenting the future of water energy efficiency in commercial applications. Um, an intuitive philosophy, the best way to escape from a problem is to solve it. There is a new awareness about how things are done in our industry. Dynamic changes continuously revolutionized design, installation, operation, and maintenance. Building owners face new expectations and decision-making processes. Building users now have a voice in the building design and retrofits as early as the design stage. Commercial building owners are facing challenges never before seen in our history. Commercial buildings started off pretty simply. I might suggest this architect's water penetration prevention plan probably should be reviewed. Then a commercial building consisted of walls, lights, operable windows, a potbelly stove, a well for water, an outhouse, and of course a lease. Then came the age of reliable central heating and cooling systems, indoor plumbing, and a uh, multitude of energy and water using appliances. Competitive owners complied. Eventually came the age of cheap electronics. Commercial tenants want lots of outlets. Competitive owners complied. Now comes green, IAQ, IEQ, sustainability, efficiency, system integration, building certification, rising energy costs, on-site renewable energy, water efficiency, and more. On-site power generation, cooling towers, stormwater regulations, new local energy and water conservation initiatives, and of course a rapidly changing economy make these issues almost impossible for the building owner, manager, engineer, and tenants to comprehend. On top of that, some of the old tried and true assumptions are going by the wayside as the tipping points for choosing one technology over another change. More buildings and more occupants mean more energy and more water consumption. Electricity is the largest energy source, followed by natural gas and petroleum products. Finite resources, particularly potable water, concerns designers, owners, and occupants in ways never seen before. Now add to this the rising costs of the two most significant natural resources allowing buildings to operate, energy and water. In most cases, it was assumed reducing the use of one reduces the other. Rise of discussion of an energy water nexus clearly points out the connectivity of these two natural resources, especially on the larger scale. The purpose of this paper, discuss how going green is changing the face of building operations. Examine the changing costs of energy and water where energy and water mix. To look at the connection between energy and water in commercial buildings 
and to discuss how these changes impact the designers and third-party professionals. People are questioning green sustainability and building rating systems. In any case, it's not as automatic as it once was. Buildings must perform as expected. This is true for all areas of green rating. For example, U.S. Green Building Council's lead process is being questioned when its expected performance and savings did not in fact occur. True green buildings must balance between economic return and environmental and natural resource factors. This includes a balance between water and energy where actions conflict and saving one uses another. In our current environment, any area where reduction of use of one natural resource impacts the use of another natural resource, a closer examination must be made to balance potential conflicts. Many factors strain our energy and water resources. Rising economies of nations, continued population growth, depletion of finite resources, and withdrawals of freshwater resources at unsustainable rates. Commercial tenants are increasingly sophisticated and clearly understand the influence of building qualities have on the bottom line. With the current glut of commercial space, building owners must have a competitive advantage to stay solvent. They are demanding buildings constructed and renovated with efficiency and sustainability in mind. McGraw-Hill surveys reported 44% of new construction and 54% of renovation project owners identified competitive advantage as a driver for selection of green buildings. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bill Hoffman. First place, I want to say we're going to have an excellent presentation looking at the great big picture of the energy water nexus uh, by Mary Ann Dickinson, the Alliance for Water Efficiency. An advertisement for them. If you have not been involved with them, get involved with them. I'm going to look at, though, a couple of areas very small to us in, within the building themselves. Here's an interesting quote. This comes from Dow Chemical. Water is the oil of the 21st century. What does this mean? Where I don't think any of us need to about, uh, even think once about all the rising cost of oil and gasoline and everything. But we have another problem that's coming out that's going to be equally as big. This is a study that a lot of you have seen. It shows where water shortages are going to occur in 36 states next year. They're here already. And by the way, California and New Mexico did not participate. And if you're anybody aware of the water situation, it's actually 38 states. With that said, here's some quotes that you want to look at. In the last year, 30 municipalities had water rates and, wa and wastewater rates combined increase of 9.4%. You can read all these cities, uh, New Orleans, 51%, all the way down to San Francisco with only a 15 or 16% increase in water and wastewater rates. Rob Emanuel has announced that Chicago will increase water rates 100% over the next five years. Very interesting, people. It's going up fast. We're lucky. We've only had an average increase in the last five years. Uh, all over the United States, of an increase in water and wastewater rates of only 27% compared to places like Australia and Canada that are in the 50, uh, greater than 50% increase in price. That's faster than oil. Wow. In fact, this is what it looks like. If you look over here, uh, well, we, you won't be able to see this, but, but if you look at oil and if you look at gas and you look at electricity, gas is actually going down some. Electricity is pretty much following inflation rates. Water and wastewater rates are going up 2.8 times faster than the inflation rates of gas and oil. I'll get to you in a minute. Um, so, you know, a lot of diff different things are happening. This is a great study uh, that is uh, actually uh, done by Dr. Janice Beecher. Here are some actual numbers. This is taken from 2010 rate study from a, you can get it online, it's Black and Veatch, uh, does this annual rate study, and they, they're always two years behind, it seems like, getting it out. But look at the combined water and sewer cost of various cities around 
around the United States. I put the five lowest and the five highest of their, uh, of their study here. And you will notice that in Atlanta, Georgia, and I called them up and asked them about this. Is this right? $23 a thousand gallons. That's 2.3 cents a gallon for water and wastewater combined. That's a lot of money, people. What we're seeing here is that with water costs rising so much faster than energy costs, there are going to be some crossovers. So what happens when they mix? Well, we've always done save water, save energy, save energy, save water. There are those times when it comes back around and bumps into each other, as you see, and that's where I want to focus on. First place, ice machines. Well, everybody knows that water-cooled ice machines are more energy efficient than air-cooled machines. And that is certainly true for the machine. So, this is straight out of uh, stuff taken. Uh, you can get this HRI database and you can look these up. I've did, I did this analysis. And you're saving about 1.2 1 to 1.5 kilowatt hours per 100 pounds of ice, because that's how they rate these machines. So your average savings is about 13 cents a 100 pounds of ice by using a water cool machine. But if you're using it as a once through cooling where you're just taking that water and dumping it down the drain, how much does that cost on the wastewater side? The national average is about $7.40 $7 a thousand gallons. If you put in there and you look at the uh, gallons, uh, and these are taken right out of the data that's available for existing machines, somewhere between 85 and 200 gallons per 100 pounds of ice, the water cost far exceeds the energy savings in almost every scenario. Ladies and gentlemen, this is done at $2.50 a thousand gallons, the lowest rate of any of the top 50, uh, largest, 50 largest cities in the United States. So this, it doesn't matter what you do, even at the lowest water rates available, at the top, at, at the, available in the United States and sewer rates combined, bang, there you are. Water costs more than the energy, so something to think about. And by the way, this also says, well, how about if it's in an air-conditioned space? Well, I've done the, the, the thermodynamics and worked out the cost on it. Even in air-conditioned spaces where you're having to run the uh, air conditioner to remove the waste heat rejected by the ice machine, it is still cheaper to do the air cool machine than the water. We did a study in California and found out, and Mary Ann's going to talk about embedded energy, and found out that the embedded energy in that water actually made these machines in the global context, uh, once through cooling with water, actually use more energy when you put in the cost of the energy in the water and the wastewater than that for the uh, air cool machine by itself. Wow. Here's another one. Look how water gets used in buildings. This is a national study. That yellow bar there is, air, is, cooling, is the cooling tower component of this. But if you're down south, like this hospital in Florida, you'll notice 43% is cooling towers. Here's a, a, a grocery stores in California, 49%. It's a huge factor. In fact, if you take a building with a 750 ton system, and look at what happens on that peak day when that thing's running at about 75% of capacity. The average water use is around two and a half gallons per uh, ton hour here in the United States. You can use over 33,000 gallons of water in one day supplied to that cooling tower. A lot of that gets evaporated, some of it gets put back in wastewater. Here's what's happening in the cost of new water and wastewater treatment capacity. Particularly look at the water side. People that are doing desal, this means, uh, this is a capacity cost now. If you build a 10 million gallon a day plant, and it's a conventional potable water plant, and it costs you $2 per gallon a day capacity, that means the capital cost is $20 million. If you build that for desal, you may be uh, $100 million for that same capacity. That's what I'm talking about here. So what happens is when that cooling tower is running at its max peak, is the same day that everybody's irrigating the craziness out of their lawns because that means it's a really hot day. So that's what drives building new water treatment capacity, just like it drives building new electric power capacity. And the impact there, does anybody know how much it costs per ton uh, for an average cooling tower? It's around $100 a ton of capacity. Well, 
to supply that water at that two dollar and fifty cent uh, at that two dollar rate, which was about the lowest you saw in there, it's about ninety dollars a ton. This is a cost to society, not to the entity. Another cost you never thought about. Wow, a lot of different things. How about the difference between energy savings and water? Cooling towers are here to stay. They're great. I'm an engineer. I've worked with cooling towers. My first cooling tower to work with, by the way, was 1967. So it also tells you about, I'm an old codger, okay? They're great, I am not against cooling towers. But here's just the facts. They save you somewhere between three and five cents a ton hour on energy. That's significant, guys. That's a big savings. But did you see how varied the cost were for water and wastewater combined. And you said, well, the wastewater don't count it because most places give evaporative credits. Did you know that I can tell you for sure, I'd work all over the United States and there are cities now that are stopping giving evaporative credits because they are so strapped for funds. American Society of Civil Engineers gives you a D minus on water and wastewater facilities. We have huge capital investments coming. So if you look at the spread, and again, it's a huge spread, of uh, the cost for water and wastewater and do that somewhere between two gallons, which is a very efficient cooling tower operation, to 2.5, which is more like normal. You can see that the water and wastewater cost, depending on where you are in the United States, are somewhere between one and, po one and six cents. Well, that's in the same bracket. At brackets either side, you have, this is how much it costs for the water, this is how much your energy savings are, there's a crossover there, and you still have chemical costs and water treatment costs for the cooling tower. There are labor costs involved. The point, we have reached a, pl uh, a place in our society where there is a lot of overlap and crossover on whether a cooling tower, th whether the water used for a cooling tower may cost more than the energy cost for the savings. Not in every case. We're in, point is, we're entering interesting times as water and wastewater costs continue to increase, and we're going to continue to have to take a look at where are the tipping points on here. Cooling towers are here to stay. Rising water costs, unfortunately, are here to stay. We have a lot of different situations. Mary Ann's going to talk to you later on about a whole bunch of other things, but the tipping points are changing. We're getting ready to have some fun. Tom? Go ahead. There you go. Thank you, Thank you Bill. A look at energy, or water and energy uh, use in commercial and institutional facilities. There is no such thing as an average building, but this figure illustrates how energy use in an average commercial building might look. The type of tenants, climatic location, and other factors influence the distribution of use in the building. The same can be said for the use of water in commercial and institutional facilities. For example, grocery stores in California typically use cooling towers for refrigeration. Cooling tower use, water use makes up half of these uh, stores use. By contrast, few grocery stores in the Northeast use cooling towers, hence cooling, towers, cooling tower use is essentially zero. With large office buildings, cooling tower use can range from 20% in the north to 50% in the south and southwest. Many of these advances are occurring in parallel. The development of energy service companies, ESCOs, has been followed by the developments of similar water service companies, WASCOs. Many, many energy and water utilities now offer economic incentives, technical information, training, and other services to promote efficiency. The development of corporate positions such as sustainability officers, annual sustainability reports, and similar business activities increase water and energy efficiency awareness. Many new developments such as ASHRAE's 90.1 and 189.1 standards uh, and new requirements from both state and federal levels continue to drive efficiency. Balancing water and energy efficiency is now always straightforward. Most of the time, saving one resource will also save another. But in those few cases where this is not true, engineers, architects, and building man managers must be aware of how to evaluate the tipping points. IATMO's Green Plumbing and Mechanical Code Supplement addresses many of these complicated issues. 
Technical competence of third party professionals is quantified through professional associations and identifiable to building owners. A good start list is the organizations listed in IATMO's 2012 Green Plumbing and Mechanical Code Supplement. Inspectors and plan reviewers must be aware of cutting edge technology and processes. Meeting code is one thing. Required critical thinking understands how design not only meets the minimum established by codes, but also how the design reaches well beyond. In the future, training and certification in both energy and water conservation practices will be central to ensuring people inspecting new facilities are up to date. This will be yet another challenge for the future. They must understand tipping points as well as codes and standards. Water people must be able to effectively communicate with energy people and vice versa. We have entered a new era where limited natural resources require us to reevaluate how we build and operate commercial and industrial facilities. Question. What is our best move forward to maximize efficiency and minimize resource use? Answer. We create processes that eliminate waste, minimize need, maximize recycle renewable resources, take advantage of distributed energy and water sources ranging from solar energy to on-site water sources. Another answer. Use the best practices for design, construction, operation and maintenance, and use of each building as a system. Yet another answer. Understand the water energy nexus. And another answer. Implement plans maximizing the potentials of alternate water sources. And the final answer. Recognize that there can be trade-offs between energy and water efficiency in some cases. Tipping points must be evaluated in these situations. Thank you. Any questions? You say costs keep going up. What's driving that? First place, uh, just it's a huge, it's the cost for the infrastructure more than the resource itself. Water and wastewater treatment facilities, uh, like I said, the infrastructure, you got a D minus on this on as far as the old stuff that's in there. We have growing populations. There's more and more demand for it. And also, as we get into places like, like in Southern California, they're looking at building a 50 million gallon a day desalinization plant because they don't have additional supplies. They have stretched those supplies to the limits. So we get more and more stringent wastewater treatment standards. It drives the cost up of everything out there. What about places like Las Vegas? I've heard that they're bringing into shortages. They are, and Doug Bennett will be talking. I, I refer to him on that. He is the water conservation coordinator for Las Vegas. They have made significant strides in water efficiency because of uh, limited water supplies. We are moving into a new world, people. And if I could add on to what Bill just said. There, it, we all, everybody in this room understands that there's two costs of water, the true cost and the build cost to the consumer. And I think those are starting to get closer and closer together. And that might be another reason for uh, exactly. price adjustment. Bill? Right. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah. Joe Catruvo, I was uh, amazed at the uh, Atlanta cost that you had up there, like $24 per 1,000 gallons. In Washington, it's about $8 per yes. 1,000 gallons now, and that's, and Washington is supposed to be a high cost area. But the, the, the big driver on all of this, by the way, is federal regulation, federal requirements, uh, uh, you know, discharge controls, uh, digging tunnels to store sewage so that you don't have overflow. That's the big driver. Yeah. Yes, it, it's, a, it's a huge driver. It's probably about 60% of the reason. The other part is, is that, uh, and, many, uh, and by the way, I called the Atlanta Water and Wastewater Utilities up and confirmed those numbers. That, that is, those are real numbers. And uh, their, their big deal there was regulation on the wastewater side and some stuff like this. So regulations is a huge component of this. But almost equally as huge is just the fact that uh, as we get more people here, they need more water and wastewater. 
the, the old easy ways of doing it are going by the wayside and the new treatment capacities are just, just to get good safe water uh, treated and distributed, it costs a lot, people. It's well, crazy. it's replacing the infrastructure. Yeah, replacing it, existing infrastructure. The yeah. existing infrastructure, of course, is sunk cost, and, 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 and so that doesn't cost that much anymore. Yeah. But, I, but, I, yeah. I was intrigued with, the impression, uh, with, with your presentation from Watts. Uh, and you, you know, right now, leakage. Uh, AWWA did a study and about 10 or 15 percent of all water use in the home is leakage. Now some of that isn't pipes, it's fixtures. But in the distribution systems, we have cities that lose 30 or 40 percent of their water uh, through leaks and pipes underground. And uh, this is uh, part of the whole thing. It's part of that deteriorating infrastructure component that we're talking about there. Uh, so, yeah, that's what's, the, there are a number of things driving the cost, not just one. Well, there, and there are a couple of other elements. Number one, water is ridiculously cheap, yes. has been for many, many years, and so now it's beginning to uh, pay actual cost, and, but it really never comes to compensating for value because it's worth a lot more than it costs anyway, yes. number one. Number two, but one of the big pressures that exists and, I, and you alluded to it, is, is the pressure between reducing consumption for conservation purposes and getting the revenue to pay for all of these increases. And that's another reason why unit costs go up, is because consumption has been going down consistently over the last 10 years, 20 years, by like one or two percent a year across the country. So, so that creates another problem. It, it's, you know, I have to say, if you look at what's happening there, though, is that through increased efficiency, and we are achieving it, what has happened is it, it has delayed the time when new infrastructure must be added to supply increasing demand. Uh, in, uh, I, you know, in places where population is growing, in the United States population is growing. Uh, if you go to some of the Rust Belt areas, no population may not be growing, but in other areas it is, and uh, a lot of that if you have conservation, you can delay when you had to build new facilities. So that takes out that part of that argument out of it there. Uh, obviously, uh, and you hit it right on the head, water is not, has not been evaluated at its true cost. And we're, as Tom said, we're moving towards that one. Oh, I'm gonna say. What's happening to uh, underwater aquifers? Are they getting pleated? Are they getting contaminated with salt? Is that a factor? Of course. Um, just just to uh, get a feel for it, uh, in Chicago, sitting right on the Great Lakes, and I mean in Michigan, they've had some significant drops in water levels, we're talking 100 feet, of groundwater levels. And a lot of the cities away from the Great Lakes are dependent on that. Uh, we have whole stretches of aquifers throughout the entire United States where significant problems are occurring. The Ogallala is one of the largest, most prolific water sources uh, in the middle of the country, going from Nebraska to Texas. It is the grain belt of America. It will run out of water. It is not being recharged at near the rate that the water is being used. Subsidence is an interesting problem. If it's from California and Texas, uh, there are areas in the Houston area where whole subdivisions have been abandoned because the ground has sunk 10 feet and they were only eight feet above sea level when they started. We are seeing problems throughout the entire United States. If you get on USGS, uh, US Geological Survey's website, you can see a lot of information on that. And if you get on the Alliance for Water Efficiency's website, you can find a lot of stuff. You can talk to Mary Ann about that when she, get, she gives her talk. It's a, it is a significant problem. We, we, people, are, are we running out of water resources? The answer is no, we have what we always have had. It's called the hydrological cycle, but it only provides X amount. And when you start out with this many people, and now you have this many people, all wanting the same resource, and we're using it like we do here in the United States, you start bumping up against Mother Nature here. And that gets, uh, that gets compounded as uh, countries that used to use X number of gallons of fresh water per capita, their economies improving, 
and now they start to approach, as Bill said, the consumption per capita of uh, you know, Europe and the United States, and we're somewhat wasteful. So not only have you more population, but more consumption per capita, and the water is not as readily available, as Bill said, the aquifers are, are uh, shrinking. I, I just have to give a plug for a book, and I don't have any financial thing on this, but it's a great book. It's called When Rivers Run Dry by Fred Pierce. And it looks at this whole worldwide type thing out there. And uh, I'm sure Mary Ann could give us a lot more good references on that, but uh, on other books too. But uh, just, it, you get through with that and it'll scare you. But these are real things that are happening. And it's got some real golden good stories in there too. Good question up front. Hey, Bill Catchfire, you know, I've done a lot of work in groundwater and, and the, um, there are issues not only with depleting aquifers, but also rising aquifers in areas like uh, Ohio, where loss in the manufacturing sector has, yes. has reduced the amount of pumping and creating problems with subsurface structure of the pipes and, and whatnot. And, and I'm wondering, you know, you think about water efficiency not only in terms of the lack of water, but also the need for self-sufficiency in the face of increasing extreme weather events, being able to have that water on site when, when we have hurricanes and, and whatnot increasing um, and, and uh, more uncertainty in terms of weather events to be able to to think about pipes and, and other uh, systems um, along those lines as well. How much is that being taken in consideration in terms of the costs uh, and, and approaches? It's uh, well said and uh, obviously the answer is sure. That's all certainly contributing to the rise in cost, the rapid rise in cost. Uh, what can I say? Uh, Doug McCluskey from Australia. I'm interested in, uh, I attended the last IAPMO conference two, or the last one I attended two years ago, and uh, water consumption at that point in time was, uh, in comparison to Australia, was uh, astronomical. And I, I note a comment earlier about water consumption being reduced by one or two percent. Uh, is, the water, is the consumption uh, being driven by the cost of the water or government making the public more aware of the, the finite resource that, that we all have? Yes to, the, yes to both of them. Yeah, I would say. And, and give, given that, that uh, in the state of Victoria where I reside in Australia, our previous state government had a, uh, a what was called a 150 litre target, which I'm, uh, my base mathematics is saying that's about 40 US gallons a day per person. And the figures that I heard previously over here in California were uh, at about, I think I worked out 400 litres per person per day. Is that has that been significantly reduced? I mean, one percent to me is is minuscule, and I, I'm just wondering about whether the public are aware enough of the fact that forget about how much more it may cost them, but but that the finite resource, in fact, uh, is the determining factor at the end of the day. You know, and and Doug's going to talk about some of this. Uh, Doug Bennett and his thing for Las Vegas. I think it'd be a very good thing to listen to. Uh, indoor use. Uh, we have uh, homes that consistently are using in the 35 to 45 gallon a day range inside the home per person, is per capita use. Uh, outdoor use, particularly in the southwest, uh, has been huge and there's been a lot of curtailment on that. Uh, uh, very important stuff, again I'll let Doug talk about that. Per capita use uh, in the uh, residential sector though is definitely going down and uh, the, aware the awareness and the rising cost are both significant factors. One of the problems that we have is, is that, as I said before, there's a difference between the true cost, the actual cost to the um, government agency that, uh, or the utility that, that uh, deals with the water and what they bill out. We know that it's subsidized. We know that uh, it's going to get closer for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, the subsidies are drying up, no pun intended. Um, but they're also realizing that, and everybody in this room understands, it's hard to justify to a building owner, operator, to spend money to reduce 
Uh, the amount of water that they're using, for example, putting in waterless urinals, low flow equipment, things like that, it's hard to justify that when what the, the first question they ask is, how long's my payback? And with an artificial, artificially low number as their cost, they're going to go, why would I want to do that? Unless they have another motivator. The motivator is not their pocket, but, but it's sort of their heart or their conscience. Okay, and they say, well, I understand that we need to take care of business here. I want to make my contribution. Let's do it the right way. Any other questions? Okay, up oh, one in the back. Yes, John Hamilton with the Testing, Adjusting, and Balancing Bureau. I was wondering on specifically the payback costs in the water industry, what do they look at? I mean, I'm from the air industry, I'm more on the air side of things, and it's pretty frustrating when people look at this payback you talk about and they say, well, it doesn't pay back in three to five years. Um, it's not worth it, but it's going to be in the building. The building is typically going to be standing for 80 years. Right. So as an industry, you're saying if it doesn't pay back in five years, the building is going to be standing for 80. There's a little bit of a discrepancy there on what true payback is right. and what direction and how are we moving away from that so we can look and say, hey, a 20-year payback is more realistic. Excellent. Even on our hydronic systems, uh, you know, even the installation when we put in a piping system, if it's going to be in the building for 80 years, maybe a 40-year payback or 60-year payback is what they should be looking at. And it's how do we move from construction cost bottom line to overall operation cost line, move it from one line item to the other line item so that the owners can see the difference and the community can see the difference. We have, and, and my colleague from the opposition, uh, Nev and Tab are competitors, but we both deal with the same problems. So we're brethren in, in that way. What he just said is absolutely true. And if you work in the United States and you work in, say, Europe, you see a contrast in attitude towards reasonable payback period. We're an instant society. My father said the downfall of the United States occurred when the microwave was invented. Okay, whatever. Um, but the point is, is that we have this mentality of a three to five year payback in the United States. You go to Europe, they talk in terms of 50 years, 30 years. And if you're an American dealing the first time with life cycle costs in Europe, you're flabbergasted. But they look at the life cycle of the building, not your ownership, or not your tenor, tenure as the CFO, COO. And unfortunately, that's our target fixation. But I, you know, we could spend an hour talking about how you motivate building owners or business owners to look at life cycle costing or look at long-term payback. I mean, we could, we could fight that forever. But I can tell you on all the committees that I sit on, and I'm sure that the rest of the guys that sit on committees here, that's always a topic of discussion. The actual value of money, how do we sell it to the building owners? How do we get them to look at life cycle costing? How do we get them to look at a larger picture than the bottom line? short term, bottom line. You, you know, and I'm going to add to this. I, I work uh, also with a, uh, one of the Wascos that he talked about. I'm uh, uh, their senior technical advisor, as they say. I guess that's because I'm old. But uh, bottom line is this. We find a lot of paybacks that are less than a year on water efficiency. If you're in Atlanta and you have a five gallon flush toilet, that's costing you uh, 12, 13 cents a flush and you put in a 1.28 and you're down to around uh, you know, two to three cents a flush, uh, you have paybacks in that area ma measured in weeks, not years. Uh, I, and even at the average cost of water throughout the United States, we, uh, on a daily basis, uh, the company goes out and it's easy to make two and three year paybacks on many of these retrofits we have out here. As you get into the longer stuff for the long term sustainability, if you put in the inflation factor, what has a two year, uh, what has a five year payback now may have a two year payback in five years, ten years or something like that. To go along with uh, also the life cycle costing is something that we don't get into too much yet. We will be, I guarantee you, in the future as we look at all these different systems. I was thinking, again, I'm going to go back to the Watts comment, uh, comments there. Uh, a pipe fixture that doesn't leak 
is, is a huge good investment for way down the road down there. We're, and uh, again, we're getting a lot of good technologies on that. So things are changing. We have one more question and then we'll have to move on. Hi, my name's uh, Stephen White. Um, I don't know if you're aware that in Europe now, uh, sewer treatment plants, both for individual properties and also for streets, are becoming more common, particularly in France and Germany. Uh, and I believe next year or the year after, the European regulation will change the water quality from the sewer treatment plant from 55% to 98%. So that means that grey water can be used internally in the building again for uh, drainage flushes and uh, etc. So that's going to have a huge infrastructure cost uh, because you're taking the waste water that would go to normal treatment plants and save. Uh, is that something that's been considered in the United thank, States? Thank you so much for bringing this up. I encourage everybody to look at the new IAPMO Green Plumbing and Mechanical Code. For the first time in the United States, as of 2010, we now have plumbing code in place that allows the builder to build to code uh, for the reuse of uh, and use of any of these alternate sources of on-site water. Uh, I, I have to tell you that there's, uh, California is just redoing its gray water rules. Uh, Cal uh, Texas has had gray water rules on the books since the, uh, for about uh, eight years now. We're looking at uh, getting those updated in, in the state of Texas. But throughout the United States, this is coming in. Yes, Europe has been way ahead of it. I, in Frankfurt, Germany, you can't build a house without putting in a rainwater harvesting system and using it in part for your toilet flushing. Thank you. This is something that the Iapmo Green Plumbing and Mechanical uh, Code people are exceedingly proud about. If I could finalize uh, the statement there uh, to in indicate what you're saying. Um, as I said, I'm the technical director for NEB and we have expertise in commissioning and uh, TAB and uh, clean room and, and all kinds of different things. And I was asked as a distinguished lecturer for ASHRAE to come and speak to the ASHRAE Society in Winnipeg. What subject do you think they want me to talk about? A subject I wrote a book on, it's called Water, Water Everywhere, which drop to drink. They want to talk about the five water systems coming into the buildings. So you're absolutely right. The trend is to start looking at that, and I'm so glad to see it. Well, Bill and Tom, thanks very much for your presentation, and we'll look for your article in uh, official magazine. <laughs>